What my original plan was, was nothing. Oh, what a surprise. I don't know what we're gonna do with that, but sure. Little um, nerve wracking. I wasn't sure if I'd be any good at it. Because the show would be impossible. Absolutely impossible. I'm sort of making a hobby of trying to throw curveballs at him. Like it still blows my mind that so many people watch this. I think we're still in a point where we're kind of limited by the resources we have. And everybody's just like, damn, that's bad. Whether it happens is up to you. My name is Jack Packard and I am the Dungeon Master and creator of the world of, co-creator with all of my players of the world of Adventures Nigh. So the Inception uh, just came because I, I wanted to play more Dungeons and Dragons. I really enjoy tabletop RPGs and thought um, that it could be fun with our crew at The Escapist. We started pitching around the idea and got uh, what I thought was a good crew together, people whom I had live streamed with before and felt like I had a good rapport with. Uh, you know, Yahtzee and Amy and Jesse and Casey are all people I had spent a little online time with. I don't know why I do quotes, Nick. I don't like this. My name is Nick Calandra, and I am the editor-in-chief of The Escapist. I guess you put on the uh, Blu-ray that I am the one of the executive producers of Avengers 9. Jack and I were working together from The Escapist show, and kind of him and I, like, I didn't know I had, like, a comedy arm to myself. And so, like, when we were kind of working on The Escapist show and improv a lot, he kind of came to me, eh, probably after if, if about 30 episodes in, and was like, hey, like, what do you think about a D&D &D show? AKA tabletop role-playing games. I don't know if we want to say specifically, but that is what we play. Trademark, trademark, copyright, copyright. I had no experience with D&D. &D. Like I've played a couple rounds with some friends and like I'm not, I'm not the kind of guy that's like gonna get into big role-playing or anything. And so I was like, sure, I know nothing about it, but you know, pitch me what you got. And he's like, I had no plan whatsoever. I just wanted to play Dungeons and Dragons. I was like, okay. I don't know what we're gonna do with that, but sure. Because I didn't know if it could be entertaining. A game of Dungeons and Dragons, when you play it at home on a tabletop, is uh, is four hours, usually one session, and then like three and a half are boring as hell. It's people like shopping and farming and rolling and doing math, and the half hour of that is the exciting part. So I didn't know if we could make anything entertaining at all. Hi, my name is Omar Ahmed, and I am the uh, producer Lead animator, lead editor. I do everything except playing the game, basically. We were testing a lot with the ZP style and what the fans would react to, what they wouldn't react to, how they would feel seeing the ZP style used in something that isn't ZP. And we know that like zero punctuation and Yahtzee is like the draw of the escapist. And so like that's kind of where the idea came from. Like, well, how can we adapt that art style into a D&D &D thing so we can take the ZP audience a general audience and a D&D &D audience and get them all together in one place to kind of like get them interested in this thing. I do think it really kind of works because it isn't a one-to-one, -one, but it's clearly derivative. And so the fans accepted it. I don't think anyone asked me to join the Dungeons and Dragons series. I sort of um, elbowed my way in. I'm Yahtzee Croshaw. I hold up the whole escapist as Atlas does the world. I have made zero punctuation, and in Adventure is Nigh, I play Mortimer Rapplesworth Everwind Smythe. And I just felt like it would be fun for a creative person who likes telling stories. Welcome to the land of Angandari, the land of the red grasses, where magic and machines have intersected in wondrous ways. Sounds like my kind of place. The world of Angandari. I want to say at the time I was doing I was doing a lot of gardening. <laughs> I was doing a lot of gardening and I was looking up different wild grasses. And uh, there is a specific grass that is native to Wisconsin that I believe is similar to the name Angandari. And so there, there's a special type of very tall red wild grass and it was close to Angandari. And so it was like, oh, it's Angandari, the land of the red grasses. Oh, that sounds great. We have not seen red grass in Adventures 9 because some people don't explore the places I want them to. I mean, I had a hoot. I thought it was freaking hoot and holler. I'm Jesse Galena and I play Grinderbin, the Dakaria artificer business mushroom. 
it did end up working pretty well that everybody just had a good time, that we wanted to be together, we wanted to spend this time together, we wanted to play these characters, we wanted to learn about this world, we wanted to unravel this mystery, we wanted to try these things, like, and that we were all bouncing off each other with excitement and sharing and stuff, that it, it was so much fun and it has honestly only gotten better. Yahtzee, Amy, and Casey hadn't played any you know, if a very little bit of tabletop role-playing games. Jesse uh, has played a bit, and so the struggles with the first, I'm gonna say full season of Adventures Nine is also just teaching them all of the things, teaching the players all the things that they can do. You know, like they have superpowers, they have things that they can do on their turn, they have special ways to investigate, and these are all little rules. And only now in season three are they actually starting to like really stretch the bounds of like, ooh, can I do this? Can I do this? Which is very fun. I had no idea what it would be like. I am Amy Campbell and I play Deborah Lee Easter on Adventure is Nigh. I genuinely just had no idea what this was going to be like. I knew it would be fun. We'd all been working together for quite a while at that point. But even looking back now, it's like, wow, we have come so far. My name is Casey Wosu, and I play Sigmar Iceblood, uh, the ASMR archer from Adventures 9. Yeah, like I, I'd never played D&D before, so initially uh, signing up to play D&D uh, for The Escapist was on one hand exciting, but on the other hand a little um, nerve-wracking because I, I wasn't sure if I'd be any good at it. I think it speaks very highly to all of the novice players how well they were able to play and how easily they were just able to roll with it and go, Let's just do it and we'll figure out the rules later. If it was like total strangers, I'm, I'm not sure we'd have uh, achieved the same level of connection or compatibility, especially not as quickly as we did. Like in the very first episode, which was supposed to be a test pilot, we were just having a lot of fun, like right off the bat. And that ended up just being episode zero that launched the whole series. And like, if that was shaky, like who knows what this would have become if it even had become anything. We did the pilot episode, which wasn't the, you know, episode zero, which was not supposed to be an episode. That was just a, hey, can all of you play Dungeons and Dragons together and can we make it entertaining? We had not planned on releasing that, but as it turns out, they're all not only very professional, they're all lovely people to play with. Uh, weird, I know. Yeah, so the pilot did really well, which I was, I was really unsure if it was gonna kind of take off. It can be kind of hit or miss with the Escapist audience, but it did like, you know, 60,000 views in the first day, which was a shock to me and I think everybody. And then kind of from there, we kind of just scrambled to figure out like, oh God, like we have something here. Like, how are we gonna do this? How much are we gonna animate? Cause it was only Omar really editing at the time with Jack and we didn't have a whole team of animators like we do now. <laughs> I remember going to Omar, like we need to animate like most of this show. And he's like, yeah, that's not possible, dude. And I'm like, please and he's just no we're not doing that <laughs> before we were like we can just have these characters on a blank background essentially and kind of paper doll our way through and at a certain point we were like we could just do this as a full show with backgrounds and music and sound effects it really does help flesh out the world and the story and make it something that the viewers can get invested in Episode zero was so fun and so unexpected. Like I walked away from that hour and a half and I remember walking into the next room looking at Alex and going, uh, Alex, my partner, and going, I think this is gonna be something special. Like I knew after that one session, I said, whatever this becomes, I think we've got something really special in our hands. And so we tested it out and the test worked. Um, well, I'm pretty good at fucking. <laughs> It all started with a book I wrote called Grindabrin's Mobile Market of Ridiculous Magic Items, where there was this traveling Dicario, it was like very personable and like fun, and just sold basically magic trash. Like the idea of having something that's so low powered, like mechanically, that like you could introduce a bunch of items to a game and it wouldn't break it, which is the opposite of most magic items. For the, I really wanted to have an a book of those items, so I made a character that can sell those items, and that's where Grinderbin came from. Can I interest you in some human pornography? When we started Mortimer was this uh, like gentleman thief, is how I called him, which is another thing uh, that I'm interested in. Someone who's got the sort of narcissistic, self-inflated view of himself. Over time, I, I guess I've settled more into sort of con artist, 
grew rather than a gentleman thief, someone who's incredibly good at lying. I think originally my idea of the character was someone who can hold his own alongside the most godlike warriors and figures in the fantasy world just because he's so good at lying, which is just as good, really. We're on a secret mission for Lady January Farfell, and you're about to blow our cover. Or perhaps you want this whole community to know that the Jade Homunculus has been stolen and that the possible thief has slipped by right under your nose because you were busy canoodling in a tavern. I've never played D&D before, and when it comes to any sort of fantasy setting, video game or otherwise, a big thing for me is, like, I can be a human every day of my life, but I want to be something strange or unusual that I wouldn't otherwise get to be. So Dabarella, it's just a silly name, I liked it. But in terms of Yeetster, it was only when everyone started introducing themselves in that episode zero and everyone else had a last name, and I started panicking and I went, I didn't think of a last name. And so just in the moment, I just went, uh, Yeetster. It literally just was this instinct improv on the moment. She wasn't meant to have a last name. I'm Deborella Yeetster! <laughs> oh, Jeebus Crisp. My inspiration for uh, Sigmar in the group on Adventures and I was always, I've always wanted a character who was sort of uh, an odd duck or who was kind of the odd man out in general. So I took it as an opportunity to kind of play in my head, a character who's a little bit of a, a jerk to give myself who in, because myself in real life, I try to play a bit of a peacemaker in all situations. So I really wanted to inject chaos uh, in a fantasy setting where there wouldn't be repercussions for such a thing. Sigmar, you land in front of Grinderbin, handless. <laughs> <laughs> For the record, that was his idea. As the dungeon master, I have to be the referee. I have to be the, the rules baron of Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, Jack's phenomenal. Like, what, what else can you say other than he's probably the best DM in the world? And I mean that with my whole heart because it's absolutely true. Like one of the biggest things that surprised me was when this started, and you know, Grinderbin was a, a character I had from something else from a book and I was like, I really like this character. I think it would be fun to play them for a game, you know, and they're a mushroom person. Are you cool with that? And he's like, yeah, sure, whatever. Jack's ability to take our bullshit and just weave it into something so brilliant and planned will never cease to astound me. When we started playing and there was the whole thing with like the Black Eyed Susans and all the Flora folk. And I was like, oh, he was ready for this. And I asked him after the season was like, oh, I didn't know like how much of that was, was planned. And he was like, oh, I did not. Plant folk was not a thing I had in mind until you brought it up. I actually really love the, the back and forth with Jack. Like Jack is really, really good at reacting to whatever you throw at him. And oftentimes, even not even within the context of the game, I'll poke at Jack just to see what he does. Seeing how the story itself has developed from very much riding by the seat of its pants to actually all of these things have been wrapped around the same ideas or themes, or it's all coming back to one central sinister plot that we just hadn't looked into yet. I'm very impressed by Jack's ability to make the story up on the fly. Because I've sort of been making a hobby of trying to throw curveballs at him because Mordor is a huge con artist and he's... That's one of the tricks in his arsenal, just striding forward as bold as you like and making up some complete bullshit that gets him through the whole thing. I was very impressed with the initial version of Adventure is Night. Like, I thought it was really cool and interesting and fun to watch. And every season, as we kind of added more elements to it, like, I'm surprised again at how much more fun and watchable it is. Like, it really just shows, like, everybody working on this, not even the people in front of the camera, everybody involved in this is super passionate about it, and, like, it shows in, like, how the production keeps growing and increasing every time. So watching the show develop more was very intimidating <laughs> because it put a lot on me to kind of turn, like, our little video production operation into an animation studio. You'll notice that Adventure is Nigh has the longest credits out of any show we do at The Escapist. And there's a very good reason for that, because the show would be impossible, absolutely impossible, without uh, all the people that we have working with us. You know, I've been on Twitter sharing behind the scenes stuff and all that, and everybody's just super excited to see everybody together in one place. I think it just becomes a lot more real for people when it's all together in like one spot. Yeah, we have an animation team, we have an audio team, essentially. 
we have uh, an art team. I mean, there's a lot of overlap, of course, because we don't have a million people to work on this. We're not like an, an actual animation company, but we, we get by. You know, the mountains behind it, the forest behind it. What a majestic visual that I'm sure is being played right now. <laughs> oh, gosh. gosh, that's an impressive castle. My favorite thing about working on Adventures Night, and this is gonna sound, I don't want this to sound canned or stupid or schmaltzy, but it's gonna, uh, it's actually playing. My favorite, favorite part of playing is when the players do something that I did not expect because that's when I actually get to play. Like if they just get through the trap how I think they're gonna get through it, okay, yeah, you did the thing I thought you were gonna do. But if they decide, to, you know, scale a wall and look over a wall. I didn't have that plan. Ooh, okay, so now I get to play along with you and make do make em ups as we call them in the biz. Yeah, I think my, my favorite moment from Adventure is Nice so far is uh, Yahtzee, when he rolls the natural one against Fudge Rucker's food. <laughs> And he rolls a natural one against that character and the entire crew is just flabbergasted. Like he put all this thought, all this plan into this and it just blew up in his face. And I just remember reading in moder like reading the comments on the YouTube video and everybody's just like, damn, that's bad. Well, I always love when Mortimer gets his little chances to shine, but I also love it when he fucks up and uh, the rest of the party have a chance to dunk on him. Like that classic natural one in the tavern. <laughs> I had it all planned. I I know you did. I think the first river sequence we got where uh, Jack pulled um, the Aedis Quiver voice out. <laughs> she looks to Dabarella uh, and she goes, Oi, who are you over there? Who's crossing my river? And then the way he then characterized Aedis Quiver, uh, kind of propositioning Sigmar on the <laughs> log just very much took me by surprise. Like, do you have a problem with us crossing the river? That's my question to her. Mm, all right, he seems pretty aggressive. He seems pretty <laughs> aggressive. I'm gonna say you, you're kind of an alpha male. Hey, hey there, asthma. I suck your dick. I suck your dick. It got such a big reaction from the players where it's like, oh yeah, that's funny, that's good. <laughs> and so like, I just like Anus. I think it's a silly voice, it's a silly character. And that's me getting to have a lot of fun. Basically anything we can do where, where synergy makes it work or fucks it up. That is just choice storytelling to me. I love all of it though. Like it's hard to say a favorite moment when the whole thing's just so good. Pretty much any time where two or more of us collaborate on a thing is just like this, this is my favorite moment. And then it happens another way. And I'm like, that, that is now my favorite moment. I'm sure I speak for the others when I say we've really gotten into our characters now. We're really invested in our backstories and things like that. I honestly get invested watching it. I'll cheer when like dice roll high. I'll like, you know, go, oh God, if somebody rolls a natural one or like let alone two or three natural ones in a row, <laughs> which has happened. Oh, no! No! <laughs> no! The community funding for this specific trip is insane, is something I, I literally did not think this was going to happen. Our editor-in-chief, Nick, was like, we'll just put it out to the fans, and if they want it to happen, they'll fund it. You know, we'll give them five, six months to reach our funding goal. And I, in my head, I was like, yeah, let's do that, because I didn't think it was going to happen, and then we wouldn't have to do it, because it's a lot of work. But it happened in under a month. It happened in Undermont and it's like, shit. Is that a fugal horn? <laughs> we did it! We did it, baby! Let's what go. was that? <laughs> what was that? I had the confidence that it would get funded. It was kind of funny to learn that he had no confidence in like season three getting funded to be on location. I was surprised at how quickly it happened. And like that makes you real excited for the future of the show and like what we're gonna do next. This feels like love, uh, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Like they seem to like love the characters we created. They could be doing a million other things. There's all this stuff going on in the world. They could be having bad days and whatnot. And it'll come and tell us that, oh, watching the thing that we did and created has like uplifted them or like made their day better or like they really needed this or they've been really waiting on this. And that really makes me feel like this, this stupid nonsense that we come up with has like a 
genuine meaning and purpose. It's very gratifying to see people take an interest in it. I always love seeing fan art of stuff that I do. That's like the most flattering thing other people can do. That or slash fan fiction. But uh, I don't want to think about that. Like Yahtzee had said, fan art. Oh my God. I love it. It, oh, it excites me to know that there's people making cosplay. I, I can't, I can't even fathom that. Whatever, Gundaman, Sigma. I got cookies. The thing that really surprised me fan art wise was uh, that horny ass drawing of Anus Quiver by El Cheshire, it was, which was just wonderful because that's actually how I envisioned her. Is just like this like wet horny goddess on the top when down below, ooh. He was able to draw her exactly how I saw her, which uh, I thought was phenomenal. People do cosplays of different characters, people doing fan art, uh, just people saying, hey, this has been awesome. Like that, just getting an at on, on Twitter and being like, I love this. Like, <gasps> that's so great. It still hasn't hit me. And I am, I am grateful every single day for the community that watch this show, that love this show, that allow it to continue to exist and push it further so that we can continue to tell this story. That to me is something I am so grateful for, like to every single person that watches it. I just want you to know, Rindabin, that you're safe. It's just the fact that we're friends that means I'm not gonna slit all your throats when I go. <laughs> That's good. I've learned kind of how awesome the rest of the cast is, like just as people in general. In terms of what I've learned though, to not be so rigid and planned that there is so much joy in chaos and <laughs> and the unplanned as characters like Sigma love to remind us. Very thoughtful people, very understanding people, always working towards the common goal in terms of making this like a good production, a good experience for everyone else. It was surprising how quickly the chemistry developed between everyone. I love the interplay between all our characters and I like to think it helps us get on as people. We've certainly been able to live together in this Airbnb relatively peacefully with just the one bathroom. Oh, absolutely nothing I've learned. No, I'm just kidding. I love being able to do it and being able to work with all of you and the people that aren't here and being able to entertain all of you. I want you to know how much that means to me. I have no more words for that. It's just very much emotional and it's, it's incredible. To be a part of this incredible dynamic with such an incredible team and the team behind the scenes too that actually bring our bizarre shenanigans to life in such a magical way. A big part has really just been giving giving people a space to be creative and like really grow. And like I feel like Adventure as an I exemplifies that the best where, you know, Casey and Amy and Jesse started out you know, either on my previous set on ASP or Gimme Memory working on reviews and not streaming or any of that stuff. The higher the production can go for this, uh, the better, because at one point I do want to see like all of this splendor like put in like an actual cinematic thing. Just bring it to the highest potential it can get to, like, because I'm an absolute fan. It's surreal, to say the very least. It is something that I do not take for granted, that I do get to be here telling this story, because it is a wonderful story. It's taking the dream and making it reality. That's the next step. I think we're still in a point where we're kind of limited by the resources we have. Actually developing this more would mean more resources, more time, more money. <laughs> Not something that we could feasibly do with all the other things that we do here at The Escapist, but. Whether it happens is up to you. Is this when we ask them for more money? So, you know, one is I'd like to take Dungeons and Dragons to the end and have that, but I'd also like to branch out and see if we could have fun with other systems. That's my goal. You're gonna, just gonna have to watch and see what comes to light. What we get to create and what we make is so magical and I think that comes down to the talent, like the unwavering creative minds that I get to work with who put this together. And that just makes it such a privilege to be involved with. At The Escape is kind of as a whole, not even just with Adventures Night, honestly, like that's a, a team that I can really appreciate and uh, really value the time I spend with. Having stuff like that is so moving and is really 
makes me so happy that I can, you know, do something that matters to someone else and that aids them. My last note is appreciation for my lovely players uh, who really seem to care about their character. I've seen them play dress up in game and that's when you know they're into their characters, when they start designing their own clothes. <laughs> I'm just happy that I get to be here and do fun things with fun people because that's what life's all about, baby. That was tense. Hey. We did it, everybody. Good job. In nice the can. Done. Wow.